continue to to add your 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 answers there. But right now it is 602. I want to welcome all of you to the Athenaeum of Philadelphia's Spring Speaker Series. We are, if you're brand new to the, the Athenaeum and this is your first time attending a program, I am Beth Hessel, the Executive Director. Also on screen, you see Tess Galen, our wonderful events coordinator who helped make sure you were able to get on tonight. If you have any technical issues, you can uh, uh, type a, something in the, in the chat and Tess will do her best to help you during the program. And we're so glad you are here. The Athenaeum is an historic uh, membership supported library and research uh, collection. Um, we have been around since 1814 in Philadelphia, survived the Great Depression, survived many, many challenges, including the current pandemic. We are so thrilled that we've been able to continue to offer first class programming online for you, for our neighbors in Philadelphia and around the country. Um, our friends in Chicago who are here tonight, we're so glad you are with us. If you like what you see and what you learned tonight and want to learn more, we invite you to contact us to learn more about how you get involved with the Athenaeum and become a member. We love having anyone who loves to learn about art and literature, history, the humanities, architecture, um, and our role in this world to become a part of our community. I wanted to, before I introduce our guest tonight, to remind you to get the best view to make sure that that little icon on the top of your computer, if you have a computer, um, not a laptop or a, a desktop computer, that it's at speaker view, that will let you see the one big screen. Um, if you want to give kudos to our speaker tonight, please put that in the chat. If you have any questions, technical or otherwise, put that in the chat and we will try to help you. If you have any questions for our speaker at any time during the program, please put them in the Q&A and I will moderate those questions during the Q&A time. We look forward always to a robust uh, question and answer period with our guest speakers. And if you are not sure, this is a webinar, so we cannot see you or hear you. Go ahead and bite into that messy hoagie or whatever you need to do while we're in this program. Um, and uh, we do look forward to being able to rejoin one another again in live programming this fall. But right now, I want to turn to our guest. It is a, a delight and a pleasure to introduce to you tonight Dr. Eric Rauschway, who is a professor at the University of California, Davis, actually where I did my undergraduate degree, and his wife was one of my um, teaching assistants way back when. <laughs> so it's a small world. Um, Eric Rauchway comes to us from the University of California, Davis. He is widely published on materials focusing on everything from um, the murder of McKin McKinley, the making of, of Theodore Roosevelt's uh, own career, uh, to the New Deal and the Second World War. He has consulted for the U.S. Department of Justice, as well as a major Hollywood studio. Um, his current book, Why the New Deal Matters, was mentioned and talked about by New York Times columnist Jamel Bowie in an, uh, a, a column last week in the New York Times on April 16th, if you want to look that up after this, this program. He has received many honors, including serving as a visiting fellow at the Corpus Christi College, Oxford. Um, he has been a distinguished lecturer for the Organization of American Historians and received the Distinguished Teaching Award from the Academic Senate of UC Davis, which is the highest teaching award at UC Davis. And I think if you're wondering, you see a, uh, a curtain there. We expect the curtains to open very soon and um, invite you to join me in a round of applause to welcome tonight's speaker, uh, Dr. Eric Rauschway. Welcome. Yeah, they're, they're virtual curtains, but thank you. Uh, so uh, thanks everyone for uh, turning up virtually, or uh, it's nice to see you or not see you as the case may be, but I hope you'll be able to see me and I look forward to hearing your questions. I will speak for a short time on the subject of why the New Deal matters, uh, but thanks to uh, Tess and Beth and to the event staff at the Athenaeum. Uh, the, Pleasure and an honor to appear, even virtually, uh, on the Athenaeum stage, uh, as we are now. Uh, this is my fourth book on the subject of the New Deal. So you may think I'd already know why the New Deal matters, uh, and I suppose I, I did. But uh, I'm grateful to my editors at Yale University Press for suggesting I write a book that kind of directly and explicitly addresses that question. Quite often, historians, which is my profession, don't 
come right out and say, my subject matters and here's why. Usually we try to come in a roundabout way, but this is a book with uh, the delightful virtue of grabbing you by the lapels and saying the New Deal matters and I'm gonna to explain to you why. And specifically because it's in the present tense, atypically for historians, I'm gonna to talk to you about why the New Deal matters in the present day. And although I will give a historically informed view of that question, this is a book that talks about where we are now, so I'm going to talk about why the New Deal matters for two principal reasons, and I'll do that for, as I say, for a few minutes, and then I'll be delighted to have your questions. So please be thinking about what questions you'd like to ask, and I will do my best to answer them. So I said two reasons. The first is the New Deal is alive and is everywhere in the United States right now, this minute, pretty much wherever you are. Now, what do I mean by that? What I mean is if you want to see the New Deal, you don't even really need to know where to look. You just need to know what it is that you're looking at. I uh, was listening, I confess to some of the answers you gave to the question of what the New Deal means to you. So I do have a sense of what you think of when you think of the New Deal. And I think that, of course, where many of us start when we think about the New Deal, we think about public buildings. So for example, if we were actually in Philadelphia right now uh, at the Athenaeum, we'd be only about five minutes walk from Independence Hall, which you can see there behind me, I think, I hope. And I could point out to you uh, that because we were a short walk from Independence Hall, that's one of the many civic buildings, many public buildings that received attention during the New Deal, where public works agencies beginning in 1936 cleaned and renovated and repainted Independence Hall in a scheme that was reflective of its sort of historical purposes and its place in the civic culture of Philadelphia of that day. So that's a common legacy of the New Deal that many of us think of, which is that there is an investment in the nation's history, its civic spaces, and our cultural landmarks like Independence Hall. Now, that's not all. Those of you with keen eyes will probably have been able to tell that what is behind me is not actually Independence Hall or even actually a picture of Independence Hall, maybe by the slightly bent spire on the top, which is not true of the real Independence Hall, uh, you could tell that this is not Independence Hall. It is, in fact, a model. In fact, it is a specific model. It is one of a series of 1 16th scale models that were made by artists working for the Museum Extension Project in 1936 and 1937. The Museum Extension Project was a program of the Works Progress Administration, whose logo you can see right there on the base of the model, the WPA, right? The WPA was the largest of the New Deal employment agencies. And its museum extension project made and distributed these models of Independence Hall in 1936 and 1937 to distribute to the nation's public schools to assist them in teaching about the 150th anniversary of the Constitutional Convention in 1937. In fact, these, uh, these models were so beautifully done that some of them didn't go to schools. Many public officials snagged one or another of them, including President Roosevelt, who had one of them on display in the Oval Office for a time during the latter part of the 1930s. So if we take together the remodeled actual Independence Hall, and the model of Independence Hall, I think we have a reasonable idea of how an awful lot of people, including as I see many of us here, remember the New Deal today. We think about public buildings, about public works that were done in part to give people jobs, but also to reinvest in a civic idea of the country. And we also tend often to think about public artworks like these, which often have some kind of historical or uh, other cultural theme that emphasizes something to do with the nation's history or democracy. And I suspect many of you will remember when I say it, if you don't already, that Harry Hopkins, who is the head of the Works Progress Administration, famously said of painters and artists and musicians that they needed to eat too, just as much as anybody else. And so they should have public jobs like anyone else in the depression. In fact, 
there were so many works of art made by folks who worked for the New Deal agencies that many of them went missing. And it wasn't until quite recently, in the last 10 or 15 years, that the government has tried to recover them. The Office of the Inspector General of the United States uh, has begun a concerted program to try to recover New Deal art. This project is called Returning America's Arts to Americans. And it's resulted in the return of paintings like this one. This is called Iris Garden. It's by a painter named Ann Fletcher, who was working for a New Deal agency at the time. And like so much New Deal art, it was casually removed from a public building that was scheduled for demolition and almost went missing itself until some folks of goodwill realized what it was and returned it. So we know about the New Deal of public buildings, and we know about the New Deal of public art, which many of which may survive, if we're lucky, in museums. And again, I heard from many of your answers that when we think of the New Deal, we not only think of public buildings and art that can be found in museums, but also of public parks. There's a lot of the New Deal's legacy in our national and, in fact, in our state parks. If you visit a national park particularly, it's not too much of a challenge to find a plaque like this one which is at the Grand Canyon, which commemorates the Trans Canyon Telephone Line. You can see one of the poles from it there, right, that stretches across the canyon. And as the plaque points out, it was constructed by workers of the Civilian Conservation Corps. Again, another public works agency of the New Deal. The CCC was founded, as the name suggests, to do the work of public conservation, reforestation, soil conservation, flood prevention, and it was devoted to hiring young men who otherwise wouldn't have had jobs. So I think that if we don't even think about it too hard, as you were just asked to do without being given any warning about what you might think of when you think of the New Deal, that's the New Deal whose legacy probably pops into our heads. We think again of public buildings, public art, public parks. But what I want to suggest to you is that this sense of the New Deal as something whose legacy we can visit, even if it's something that's quite inspiring, but we still think about it as something that we can go to, that undersells the importance and durability of the New Deal today. Now, when I said at the start that the New Deal is right now pretty much alive and everywhere in the United States, I really meant everywhere, especially if we think about economic activity. So for example, and I'm only gonna give you some examples, but I hope it will make the point adequately. I won't have to try to be exhaustive or exhausting in running down what's currently operating that is part of the New Deal. If you have a bank account in the United States today, you have dealt with the legacy of the New Deal because of course the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, which ensures your deposits in that bank against depredations of uh, bad character or merely of incidents, is of course a creation of the New Deal from 1933. If you've used the money in your bank account to buy stocks, then you've come into contact with the New Deal, which established the Securities and Exchange Commission to enforce transparency laws for securities dealings in 1934. If you bought a house, you've certainly made use, even if just indirectly, of the New Deal, whose Federal National Mortgage Association, better known as Fannie Mae, was created to enable a national mortgage market in 1938. But you don't have to be carrying on high finance to feel the economic impact of the New Deal in our lives today. If you've ever joined a union, you've made use of the New Deal, thanks to, again, I heard somebody mention in the question at the start, the Wagner Act of 1935, which protected the right of workers to organize and to bargain collectively with their employers. And that's not all. Of course, if you've ever even just been in a minimum wage job, you've benefited from the New Deal, thanks to the Fair Labor Standards Act of 1938, which also barred child labor in the United States of America. Moreover, of course, if you or somebody in your family has drawn a federal old age pension or unemployment insurance, you've made use of the New Deal thanks to the Social Security Act of 1935, which provided for those forms of social insurance and also for the basis of federal disability benefits. So again, those also stem from the New Deal today. But even all of that, if you take all of that together, that still underestimates the economic ubiquity of the New Deal. 
If you have ever earned, spent, borrowed, or even just held in your hand a bill of the United States currency, you've made use of the New Deal. The dollar we use today, as you can see from the date there and the signature of Henry Morgenthau Jr., the Secretary of the Treasury under Roosevelt, right? The dollar that we use today is a creation of Franklin Roosevelt's first days in office when he took the dollar off the gold standard as one of the first steps in seeking to remediate the effects of the Great Depression. And Congress gave him the authority, which has since been devolved on the Federal Reserve, to change the value of the dollar to ensure the smooth functioning of the United States economy. And as I say, even that's just getting started, but I wanna to try to emphasize how the New Deal really is alive and everywhere today. I mean, I haven't even suggested at this point how the New Deal shaped the way we use, use land in the United States. The New Deal brought an end to the 19th century policies of homesteading and of allotment, which allowed the breaking up of federal land and of native land and parceling them out to individual landowners. Instead, New Deal laws put the range into the trust of the grazing division of the Department of the Interior to promote the sustainable use of the American prairies and the Great Plains, while the New Deal also restored native lands control to native nations, which renewed recognition of their sovereignty from the United States government under New Deal policies for Indian uh, peoples. The New Deal also brought, as many of you will know, and again, I heard that mentioned in our opening section, electricity to rural America. It brought fertilizers to farmers. It brought erosion control to the grasslands and to the agricultural fields of the West and the South. Even further in its impact on how Americans use land, the New Deal knitted all of these disparate parts of the United States together. The road building programs of the New Deal, which were by far the largest programs of the WPA, even if we think of the arts programs, that's really a tiny, tiny part of what the WPA did. The largest part of it, whether you consider it in terms of money spent or people employed, was spent on roads, road building, road widening, construction of sidewalks and other improvements for roads, which made the remoter parts of the United States accessible for the first time for travel and commerce by automobile or by truck. It is no exaggeration to say that the New Deal literally tied the country together with its power lines and its roads, thus making the post-war economic boom possible because of this ease of transit and communication. We could go on in this vein. The air traffic control system that we now have begins with the New Deal. So does the Federal Communications Commission. So do any number of things that don't even come under that sort of heading of infrastructure improvement normally, like, for example, the enforcement of civil rights laws by the Department of Justice at the federal level. In short, it even understates the case to say we cannot go through a day without making use of some part of the New Deal. It is more correct to say that it is nearly impossible to get outside the New Deal in the course of an ordinary day in the United States. And in fact, even if you're outside the United States, the New Deal shapes the way the world works. The International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, and indeed the United Nations itself, are institutions that carried New Deal programs and ideals right through the war years and into the post-war world. We live in a world that the New Deal built or that Americans built through the New Deal, both for ill as well as for good, though I think mostly the latter. So as I said, the first thing to think about when we ask why the New Deal matters is to realize that the New Deal gives shape to our world every minute and we reckon with it every day. It isn't something just for the past and just for museums. It is something that is alive and part of our everyday lives. As I say, that is the first thing that I want you to think about when I ask you to think about why the New Deal matters. But of course, I started by saying there are two main reasons that the New Deal matters and it's ubiquity, it's everywhereness, it's everydayness is only the first of those two things. So here is the second. The New Deal amounted to a statement of national purpose for the United States of America. Indeed, 
I think it's easy to say it was the largest and the most successful statement of national purpose for this nation that involved construction rather than destruction. It may in fact be the only such statement of national purpose for the United States that involved construction rather than destruction, but it is certainly the largest and the most successful. To illustrate that point, I wanna take you back again to Philadelphia, where we are virtually anyway, during the New Deal. And I'm gonna give you some sights and sounds from the Democratic National Convention of 1936, which happened to be held in Philadelphia in that year. So I'm gonna give you about a minute and a half from Franklin Roosevelt's acceptance speech of the nomination together with some footage of the convention in Philadelphia in 1936. Philadelphia is a good city in which to write American history. <laughs> This is, this is fitting ground on which to reaffirm the faith of the fathers, to pledge ourselves to restore to the people a wider freedom to give to 1936 as the founders gave to 1776, an American way of life. An old English judge said once upon a time, necessitous men are not free men. Liberty requires opportunity to make a living, a living decent according to the standard of the time, a living which gives man not only enough to live by, but something to live for. So what I wanted you to hear there in Roosevelt's acceptance of the renomination of his party for the presidency is his own invocation of the New Deal as a rechartering of American freedoms for Americans. As he said, necessitous men, that is to say, needy men are not free men. And of course, I, when I say that, I am aware of the exclusionary nature of the language. Roosevelt would, of course, have thought it's okay to say men when you mean everyone. But he says, necessitous men are not free men. People need to have enough in their lives to make decisions about what they should do, that political freedom is meaningless without economic freedom, that people need, as he says, something to live for in addition to something to live on. And he deliberately invoked the idea of the nation's founding, and he wanted his supporters and voters in 1936 to think of the New Deal as a renewal of the purposes of the founding, and of course, an extension of it into the future. And what I've got behind me here is part of what was looming in Roosevelt's thinking and of course in his language at the time. Why did the United States need to devote itself afresh to the idea of freedom and of democracy? You can see here that in the speech Roosevelt invoked as he often did some of the language of the King James Bible here talking about faith, hope, and charity. But when specifically when he talks about faith, he talks about faith in the soundness of democracy in the midst of dictatorships. And this, I think, is the most vital thing to remember about the New Deal. The New Deal is a rescue program, a renewal program for democracy, not just in the United States, but in a world where it's under threat from fascist dictatorship. We remember the Depression, of course, as a crisis of the economy, and maybe we even remember when we do that, that it's a crisis of the global economy. But we need to remind ourselves that Franklin Roosevelt and many, many Americans of the time thought of it as a crisis also of democracy. For four solid years during the depression, the economy got worse, prices fell so that 
Farmers couldn't profitably harvest their crops and bring them to market, and they just left them to rot in the field, when at the same time, Americans were overwhelmingly hungry, if not actually starving, in the nation's cities. Unemployment got up to levels that were probably quite close to, if not actually at 25%. And even for the Americans who remained employed, the vast majority of them were underemployed, working part-time jobs, because there simply wasn't enough work to go around. The economy was manifestly broken, and it seemed as though elected governments couldn't do anything about it. Or at any rate, it was clear that they wouldn't do anything of consequence about it. Particularly, so far as President Herbert Hoover was concerned, the federal government was devoted to the proposition that it should do nothing or as little as possible on behalf of unemployed Americans, because to do that risked a step towards socialism or indeed, as Hoover would say, towards Moscow. Unless, of course, unemployed Americans were to protest this inaction, in which case the government could vigorously leap to the purpose to rouse itself swiftly to send the army to tear gas those protesters and run them off. Which is why within the United States and around the world, through the course of the Great Depression, Americans began to wonder if democracy had reached the end of its history because it was ineffectual or seemed to be ineffectual in the teeth of the depression. And Franklin Roosevelt was even more than most people sensible of this threat. When he was elected to the presidency in 1932, a friend told him, if you succeed, you will be remembered as one of the best of American presidents. And if you fail, you will be remembered as one of the worst American presidents. To which Roosevelt replied, if I fail, I will probably be the last of the American presidents. Between Roosevelt's election in 1932 and his first inauguration in March of 1933, Adolf Hitler came to power in Germany. In defiance of the confident prediction of all observers that surely the conservative leadership of Paul von Hindenburg would never permit such a thing to happen. And then when Hitler became chancellor in Germany, he immediately began setting about imprisoning enemies of the state, including communists and socialists and Jewish people in concentration camps, defying the predictions of observers that Hitler would never govern so radically as he had campaigned. Roosevelt was one of the few people in 1932 and 1933 who took Hitler at his word and who regarded him as, as great a threat as we now in retrospect know him to have been. Uh, what you're seeing here on the picture behind me is the flyleaf of Franklin Roosevelt's own copy of Adolf Hitler's Mein Kampf. Um, so this is Roosevelt's handwriting that he's written in the uh, beginning of his copy of Mein Kampf, or rather of his copy of the English translation of Mein Kampf, which came out in the fall of 1933. And what Roosevelt has written here is this, transla this translation is so expurgated as to give a wholly false view of what Hitler really is or says. The German original would make a different story. Roosevelt often wrote things in his books. This is probably one of the two uh, best known comments that Roosevelt wrote in his books. The other one, um, Roosevelt wrote in a sort of proto-Keynesian book that he didn't believe you could, with economic policy, get something from nothing. So not all of his notes to himself make him look good in retrospect, but this one does. Because Mein Kampf, which had originally been published in German in 1925, gave a much clearer view of Hitler's devotion to violence and anti-Semitism in achieving the aims of Nazism. For its publication in an English translation, so as not to alienate potential supporters of Nazism in the English-speaking world, the authorities of Nazi Germany had, as Roosevelt said, expurgated Mein Kampf and cut much of Hitler's bigotry and violent rhetoric out of the text so that English speakers or English readers who are only aware of this edition might treat Hitler's nationalism as something they themselves could agree with. But Roosevelt had a better idea of what Hitler said, the kinds of things that he said. How did he know this? Well, for one thing, Roosevelt himself did read German, and Hitler had given plenty of speeches, which were published 
in which he explained what he really thought. Roosevelt also had friends and associates who spent time in Germany and had heard Hitler speak and had a better idea of how dangerous he really was. By 1932, Hitler had begun publicly to describe Nazism as his program to allow Germany to achieve the economic strength that he saw in the United States. As Hitler said, if you want to mobilize Europe against the danger of American power, you will do it only under the leadership of a state which acts consciously according to racial laws. And Hitler warned that all of Europe is moving toward a hard fate if American expansionist economic activity is not stopped somewhere and sometime. So Roosevelt knew how Hitler thought about Nazism and also how Hitler thought about America as the principal threat to Germany. Which is why when Hitler came to power in January of 1933, Roosevelt told one of his aides, a man called Rex Tugwell, that the accession of Hitler is a portent of evil for the United States. He will in the end challenge us because Nazism cannot exist permanently in the same world with a system whose reliance on reason and justice is fundamental. Roosevelt from the very start, even from before he first came into the presidency, understood Nazism as an existential threat, not just because Hitler was a problem and because Hitler might bring Germany into another European war that he would start, but as Cogwell pointed out in his diary, because Roosevelt understood that Nazism had an appeal to some Americans. Not only had the new Nazi government already established propaganda operations in the United States, which would continue to spread anti-Roosevelt and anti-New Deal messages throughout the 1930s and into the start of the 1940s, but there were homegrown movements that worried Franklin Roosevelt already in 1933. For example, in 1932, some thousands, maybe as many as 20,000 unemployed veterans of the Great War, as it was then called, came to Washington, D.C. to protest the government's inaction in the face of the Depression. They came specifically to petition Congress for an early payment of the lump sum that they were owed for their service in the Great War. That sum was referred to as the bonus, which is why the group was called the Bonus Army, or the Bonus Expeditionary Force, or the Bonus March. While they were in Washington, they established a camp on the National Mall and a further camp nearby and a couple of further camps and disused buildings in Washington, D.C., so that they could remain and petition the members of Congress for this relief from the Depression. Now, while they were there, the House of Representatives passed a bonus bill. President Hoover said it would veto it. He didn't have to because the, the Senate declined to pass the bill. But the bonus army remained in Washington, despite the rejection of the legislation in this camp, where they had their own newspaper, they had their own businesses, where they had their own drilling exercises to march around and to protest against the inaction of the federal government. Their leader was a man called Walter Waters. And Walter Waters styled himself as potentially an American strongman along the lines of Benito Mussolini or Adolf Hitler. He was only one of many Americans who saw in the thousands of unhappy veterans the seed of a potential movement. These were people who had sacrificed to make the world safe for a democracy that they believed had now abandoned them and had specifically abandoned them right there in front of them. Walter Waters suggested a veterans movement in the United States could be called the cat t-shirts, deliberately modeled on Adolf Hitler's brown shirts or Benito Mussolini's black shirts. Who knew where such a movement could lead? Now, President Hoover eventually called out the United States Army to drive away the bonus marchers using tear gas and tanks and cavalry. Franklin Roosevelt was worried that that kind of armed response to protest, that meeting disaffected Americans with force could only increase their disaffection, could only increase their belief that government under the Constitution did not work for them. 
As Roosevelt had said when he accepted the Democratic nomination for the first time in 1932, reaction is no barrier to the radical. It is a challenge, a provocation. The way to meet that danger is to offer a workable program of reconstruction. And that, to Roosevelt, as to others, is what the New Deal was for. To reconstruct American democracy, to reaffirm Americans' faith in it in, as you saw Roosevelt say, a world of dictatorships. So when Roosevelt ran for president for the first time in 1932 and promised massive programs of public works, those public works programs were not merely meant to give unemployed Americans jobs and put money in their pockets. They were a way to, as Roosevelt said, restore the close relationship with people which is necessary to preserve our democratic form of government. Roosevelt meant the New Deal to revive for Americans a sense that the government belongs to us, that its works belong to us, and that they work for us. I've already mentioned the Civilian Conservation Corps, which preserved and improved public lands, and which was and remains broadly popular, but it's worth noting that the CCC was open specifically to a group of Americans who desperately needed what Roosevelt said the New Deal was there to offer, something to live for. The CCC offered employment specifically to jobless young men, a group who would otherwise, and in many countries had already proven, the seed of right-wing movements. And Roosevelt ensured that the CCC was not only open to young men, but also to veterans of the Great War, like those who had marched in the Bonus Army. Those jobs were not merely jobs. Those jobs were not merely jobs to restore the land, although they were those things. They were also jobs to restore Americans' faith in democracy. And it worked. In the first months of Franklin Roosevelt's presidency, some thousands of the bonus marchers decided they were going to return to Washington, D.C. to renew their protest. Walter Waters turned down the offer to go with them. Remember, he was the one who styled himself the potential leader of the khaki shirts. But in 1933, after only a few weeks of Roosevelt being in office, he said, there's no need for it now. We now have a government that is recognizing and attempting to improve the unemployment situation. And that's all, Waters reasoned, that the bonus marchers and indeed the rest of America's citizens and workers really needed. The New Deal was already, even in the first weeks of its operation, defusing the discontent that could lead to fascism and was restoring Americans' faith in democracy, and it continued to do so throughout Roosevelt's presidency, strengthening Americans' sense of who they were and of who they could become. And it worked. The economy improved. America's faith in America improved. The New Deal's devotion to what Roosevelt called a broadening conception of social justice, yes, those are his actual words, won over voters who historically had no interest in the Democratic Party, most notably black voters who shifted to Roosevelt en masse between 1932 and 1936, and who, together with many other constituencies, were the reason that, after giving that speech that we saw in Philadelphia in 1936, Roosevelt was re-elected in a landslide victory the largest margin that any American president had won since James Monroe ran essentially unopposed. The New Deal worked. It was imperfect. Its legacy was and remains imperfect. But it matters that it held out this promise of renewing democracy, and it demonstrated that it was willing, however imperfectly, to deliver, to realize, even partially, and improved democracy for Americans. Which, of course, is why even Americans, and indeed people around the world, who are mindful of the New Deal shortcomings, will still invoke it today. The language of the New Deal is still available to us when we talk about renewing our nation and renewing our democracy, and that is as good a reason as any to say that it matters. Okay.
that's what I got. Now I'm going to be uh, delighted to take your uh, questions, which I think that's probably been accumulating. And uh, you may see me doing what I'm doing now, which is not looking at the camera because that's where the window showing Beth is uh, in the space that I'm in. <laughs> so I apologize if I look away for a bit. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Rauchway. The questions are indeed coming in. I invite you all, if you have any questions, to, to put them in the Q&A and we will get to them. Um, one, I think I'm just going to put out there now because you can answer in the chat if you know the answer to this, um, because I, I don't know if, if Eric will know it. I don't know it. Um, but the question came in right away. If um, anyone knows where you can find a scale model of Independence Hall, such as the one you displayed here in Philadelphia. Um, no, I don't believe the Athenaeum has one, but if anybody knows, and we have some people who know so much about Philadelphia, um, just just uh, add to the chat um, for that one, and then I'll get one for you, unless you happen to know. I can tell you that the one that I showed you uh, is I'm virtually certain in the collection of the Franklin Roosevelt Library and Museum in Hyde Park, the uh, Presidential Library, which is on the site of uh, Roosevelt's family home. Okay, and the, the Pennsylvania State Museum in Harrisburg does have one, um, but if anybody knows of where we can view one uh, closer to Philadelphia, that would be fantastic. Uh, so Richard would like to hear from you what analogies you see with the New Deal and what the Biden administration is trying to do. Um, I'm glad you said what they're trying to do, because I think that um, much depends on what happens in the coming weeks and months. I mean, I think specifically, if um, something like the proposed infrastructure bill passes, that will be something like the New Deal in many ways, right? The um, stimulus bill that we, the Stimulus Act, rather I should say, that we had passed already, that's not really like the New Deal in, in, in many respects, right? The It's important to remember, as I kind of alluded to in the middle of the, discussion there that the New Deal wasn't primarily Keynesian in character. Right? It didn't provide economic stimulus or solely economic stimulus. It did work in that way, but that wasn't its primary intent. Right? Its primary intent was to kind of rebalance the scales of economic justice, to give power. And I'm afraid that uh, as in that phrase, as in many, your metaphors tend to collapse to literally give power right, to groups in the United States who didn't have it before, as well as to metaphorically uh, give power to them. And again, the, the uh, infrastructure bill that is currently uh, you know, being debated stands to do that. Right? It has a lot of provisions in it that would seek to empower groups who have otherwise been powerless to seek to use uh, publicly funded employment as a way to improve working conditions, which is one of the principal ways that Roosevelt thought about publicly funded employment, and to, of course, build stuff that we can point to, you know, like solar panel arrays and wind farms and you know, flood prevention facilities for coastal areas, to, to build those kinds of things that we can point to and say, we have done that you know, for ourselves together. And of course, the, the uh, infrastructure bill is also specifically aimed at redressing some of the legacies of inequity that stem from the way the New Deal's programs were implemented. So in that respect, too, it also stands to be somewhat New Deal-ish uh, in its um, behavior. And although President Biden hasn't quite framed things this way, I think that there is some sort of link between his calls for, you know, renewing the nation's uh, soul and Roosevelt's, you know, conviction that America's faith, as you saw, needs to be restored in democratic institutions. All right, we're getting some more questions in. Um, Tom, building on that, uh, is interested in what the, what, what might be the limits of the New Deal as a roadmap for today? Well, I'm sure many of you know, but it's worth spinning out that the Democratic Party, as it existed in the 1930s, was sharply divided between the solid Democratic South, where it was a one party state and it was a Jim Crow state where disfranchisement in both law and violence were used to keep black people from voting. And that's a legacy of the Civil War because of, the, of course the Republican Party had been the party of Lincoln. So uh, white folks in the South tended not to be uh, partisans of the party of Lincoln. Right? So there's that party. And then there's the party of Northern cities, 
which tends to be a much more multi-ethnic and indeed multi-racial party. Uh, that's the party in Boston, the party in Philadelphia, the party in Detroit, and the party in Chicago, and the party in San Francisco, and of course the party in New York City, right? That's what allows Democrats to win states like Roosevelt's native New York. So the party being divided that way, you know, put limits on the New Deal. If the party had only been its northern wing, right, it would have been a much more liberal, not to say left or progressive party. It still was. You may have been able to spot in the footage from the 1936 convention that, you know, the placards said Franklin Roosevelt for progressive government and things like that. And uh, it's true that, as I pointed out, that ultimately the Roosevelt administration did create what was first called the Civil Rights Section and then later called the Civil Rights Division in the Department of Justice, which became instrumental in pushing forward voting rights uh, for black Americans over the wishes of the southern wing of the party. But the party was always divided along those lines. And so when New Deal projects were implemented by the Democratic Party in the South, as for example, if you think about the Tennessee Valley Authority, for example, they tended to preserve segregation. Although there were black workers, there were even white collar black workers for the TVA. It was still a segregated program. Unlike, though, the Works Progress Administration, which actually first is a matter of law, a uh, policy, and then as a matter of law, uh, you know, was not allowed to discriminate on the basis of race and hiring. So, you know, that that fissure characterized the New Deal, and obviously, you wouldn't want to have something like that in any program today. And as I pointed out, of course, the uh, infrastructure bill is supposed to try to redress some of that legacy of inequity. Um, it's also true that, of course, the Democratic Party as it exists today looks very little like the Democratic Party of the 1930s. Uh, the White South generally does not vote for Democrats today. So there are a couple of questions that, that build on that. Um, Sidel, and I'll, I'll just see if I can combine these a little bit. Um, Sidel wondered if you could comment on FDR's compromises with the, the Southern Democrats. And Gideon also um, wonders how Roosevelt's 1938 attempted but failed purge of Southern conservatives feature in the legacy of the New Deal. Um, so yeah, as far as the first question goes about compromises with the Southern Democrats, especially in his first election campaign, you know, Roosevelt did not win a majority of the black vote in 1932. There was a notable shift towards Roosevelt, but it wasn't a, an outright victory. That only came in 1936. And in 1932, when the head of the NAACP wrote to the Roosevelt campaign and provided a draft speech for Roosevelt to give that would guarantee that the New Deal would include uh, black voters, Roosevelt rejected that overture um, at the same time, because he didn't want to alienate white Southerners. You know, at the same time, the campaign set up a speaker's bureau with uh, black speakers who were representatives of the Brotherhood of Sleeping Car Porters to go to black communities and say that the New Deal was going to improve the lives of poor Americans and black Americans were overrepresented among poor Americans and so they should vote for the New Deal. Now, as I say, it wasn't until the New Deal was an actual fact in front of black voters that they came to, as a, as a, as a block of voters, support the New Deal, and that happens by 1936. And then they become and remain an important part of the Democratic Party's uh, coalition. In the 1938 elections, as uh, your second part of your question asked, Roosevelt tried to campaign against, or did campaign against rather, a number of more conservative and particularly white Southern um, senators in the uh, primary elections. And Roosevelt was unsuccessful. In doing that, I think in almost every case, not, not in every case, but in almost every case, he was unsuccessful in getting those uh, conservative Southern Democrats unhorsed. They remained in the Congress. And in fact, the 1938 elections were a little bit of a rout for the Democratic Party. Uh, under Roosevelt, the Democrats were often defeated um, in Northern uh, seats. And although they held the Southern seats, it was the more conservative Democrats um, who held those Southern seats. So the Congressional Party was more conservative after 1938. That's why, uh, in the wake of that election, Roosevelt and his Justice Department do create the Civil Rights Section to try to dismantle 
the structure of power of the white Democrats in the South. The first case that they bring, which they win at the Supreme Court, uh, is a case that says that primary elections are subject to federal law and therefore you know, the federal government can begin to regulate them, which folks immediately realizes means that you cannot have an all white primary election anymore. So they, their reaction is not to compromise after 1938, to sort of double down on trying to beat the white Southerners uh, where they are strongest. Now that whole program will be wrapped up in the war and in preparation for the war, which will complicate uh, everything about the history of the New Deal, but including that. And in his, um... You, 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 you show that he um, recognized early on the threat that Hitler and uh, fascist movements in, uh, in Europe presented, and yet he avoided, as long as he could, getting into the war. What, how, how do you square the, that, that tension? Um, and and, and what, 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 did, what, from your, your research on, on Roosevelt, was he, you know, how was he hoping to confront or, or, or face fascism abroad? Well, I don't, I don't think I would say that Roosevelt avoided getting into the war as long as possible. I mean, what I would say is that, uh, you know, first of all, in 1933, even though Roosevelt predicted as of about May that there would be another European war because of Hitler, he didn't anticipate that the Americans would have to get involved. He, in fact, predicted that the United States would have to provide material aid to France and Britain, which, of course, was the first thing that the United States did in 1941. Um, but also, you know, Roosevelt tried in 1933 to get Congress to give him uh, a select the power to impose a selective embargo against what they then called aggressor powers. And Congress wouldn't do it because they feared that Roosevelt would in fact, use it to get the United States aligned alongside the anti-fascist powers, which was something that uh, sentiment in Congress was adamantly opposed to. So too, indeed, was uh, what we would now call media sentiment in the country. In those days, of course, they called it press sentiment, right? The press sentiment was what was then called isolationist. That is to say that they strongly objected to opposing the Nazis and to align the United States with nations opposing the Nazis. So Roosevelt had a, an uphill climb against public opinion, against many uh, congressmen and senators. And of course, that took the form of pushing back on neutrality legislation. It was first passed in 1935. Roosevelt kept trying to get it modified, eventually got it modified so that uh, you know, the United States could provide goods on a cash basis to belligerents then modify so that they can provide munitions on a cash basis to belligerents. And then finally in 1941, the early 1941, so that they could provide uh, goods without cash uh, to belligerents in the land lease program. So I think Roosevelt is visibly waging a long uphill uh, struggle, as I say, against uh, neutrality or isolationist sentiment in the United States. And that's something that kind of characterizes his uh, politics in the 1930s. His priority is, you know, strengthening the United States, strengthening the American economy, strengthening the American democracy. So if it's going to cost him significant support for the New Deal, he's not going to prioritize foreign policy. But it's certainly something that increasingly becomes a priority, whether he wants it to be or not, uh, certainly by the latter part of his second term in office. So there's one one last question is wondering if you know a little speculation but um if if he, he had not died what do you think he would have accomplished in his uh final term um right so you know franklin roosevelt was re-elected uh to a fourth term in november 1944 he was inaugurated in january 1945 and he died in april so he didn't have very long of his fourth term and you know he had, um, he died just as shortly before VE Day. He died April 12th, VE Day is May 8th. So, you know, victory in Europe was visible at that point. Um, victory in the Pacific was probably quite plausible. It's just a question of what cost uh, that, 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 and, you know, Roosevelt probably didn't have to think about that before his death. As you probably know, in the latter months of his life, he was bound up with the effort to press forward with a United Nations organization 
which ultimately was successful after the San Francisco conference of that spring. Um, at the same time, he was forced in peace negotiations to concede a lot to the Soviet Union, especially in Eastern Europe, that wasn't consistent with his vision of the post-war world. And some of that, in fact, pretty much all of the important part of that, Roosevelt didn't reveal to anyone, even including his vice president, who became his successor, Harry Truman. So I strongly suspect that since Roosevelt was willing to keep that matter a secret, that he expected to finesse it, as he had so many contradictions throughout the course of his presidency by his political skill and luck. But whether he would have been able to finesse it is, of course, another question. Well, thank you. Thank you for a, a wonderful talk. And uh, Tess is going to put up now um, on the screen. Just get it. <laughs> where, to, where to buy the book? You want to learn more, you can get it at Yale Books, 25% off with the code Y-E-N-D-M. -E um, as you see, this is a, a, a great topic with uh, a lot of stuff to think about for our current past and current, and uh, we're so grateful to you, uh, Dr. Eric Rouchway, for your time this evening. Uh, invite everyone to uh, not miss out on upcoming programs that we have at the Athenaeum. Uh, next week, we have uh, Claudio Sant, another, another uh, highly regarded uh, historian on his book, Unworthy Republic, The Dispossession of Native Americans and the Road to Indian Territory. Um, Dr. Rick Bell, who has been teaching a class this month on uh, slavery in the American Revolution, will start his next class will be Mondays in May at noon on uh, Women and the American Revolution. May 3rd, you can register for that class online. May 5th is part of our Architecture Built Environment series. We have uh, Vishan Chakrabarti of UC Berkeley and New York on the Architecture of Urbanity. I hope you will join us for future programming and um, become a part of us. Oh yes, we have more of our very intimate, uh, socially distanced, masked, very, very safe, small group gathering in our reading room uh, for two more uh, uh, chamber music concerts, May 7th and June 4th with uh, a, a well-known, amazing artist. So I invite you to join us if you are uh, here, otherwise you can live stream it if you're coming from elsewhere. Thank you so much, uh, Eric Rouchway, for your time this evening and for helping all of us learn more. Um, I know it's not even evening for you yet out there in California. I hope you have wonderful weather and a great rest of your week. Uh, everybody, please join me in thanking our, our guest speaker this evening, and we look forward to seeing all of you back again soon. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Learned a lot there. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much. Sure thing. I sent a screenshot to my brother, who's a professor, to tell him that he needs to up his Zoom game. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it would right. work the same. He teaches uh, biology, so I don't know if it would work the same because he probably needs more text on his slides, but we'll see. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, and thank you, everybody, I'll for attending. Bye. <laughs>